Hello Interwebs, I hope you're all doing well. So for today's video, I wanted to do a discussion surrounding a recent discourse and controversy that transgender activist and actor Hunter Schaefer, who is creepily hanging out over my shoulder here, has found herself embroiled in surrounding her potential transmedicalist views, as well as how those views connect with recent attacks on transgender rights, and specifically attacks on access to trans-affirming healthcare throughout the United States. Now, for those of you out there who don't know what a transmedicalist is, don't worry, I will go over that viewpoint and explain it, explain it, explain it, I'm good with words, uh, in just a little bit. But I actually wanted to discuss this controversy overall, not for the Hunter Schaefer of it all, but because I think this controversy actually provides us a really nice starting place to enter into this larger conversation about how we view trans people, the problem with a transmedicalist viewpoint, how transmedicalists often misunderstand what logic guides attacks on trans rights from right-wing groups and uh, other people's misunderstandings of the reasoning behind those attacks as well, and then how all of this leads to trans community infighting, and then how that infighting ultimately only benefits those who are attacking trans rights in the first place and not trans medicalists or all trans people in any way, shape, or form. So basically, while I am going to be talking about Hunter Schaefer specifically, I'm ultimately less interested in her and more on the larger discussion at play here. And so as a result, this video is gonna be kind of just more of a discussion and just me sitting and talking to all of you about all this. It's not gonna be one of my more over the top, like big cosplay videos that I've been doing, like the one I did recently on Matt Walsh. By the way, I will talk about my Matt Walsh video if all of you are curious about that. My next part is coming and it is a very big one uh, and I am doing a lot of big stuff for it so we'll talk about that and I'll share update about that at the end of this video but for now this is just going to be kind of a casual conversation uh, about these issues because I just want to have a, a more laid-back talk with everyone about it and also I'm releasing this video this week instead of part two of my analysis on the politics of the Amazon Prime TV show The Boys because I'm currently dealing with some problems with YouTube censoring and blocking and demonetizing that video. So don't worry, it'll be coming out next week at some point and my patrons will be able to have access to the video early because they don't have to worry about YouTube nonsense. But for now, you'll just have to wait and uh, you get this video in the meantime. So let's start the conversation. For those of you who don't know who Hunter Schaefer is, she is a 23-year-old transgender actor and activist who's garnered a lot of praise for her activism in recent years for the trans community. Uh, she's been featured in Teen Vogue, um, she was even in Time Magazine as a Top 100 Emerging Leader, and she's started to garner even more mainstream attention for her role in HBO's Euphoria, where she plays a trans character there, as well as uh, the fact that she'll probably be getting more attention for her upcoming role in the Hunger Games prequel movie. And so as a result, she's emerging as a, you know, upcoming leader for many trans people, especially trans youth of her generation. And I just realized by saying that, that, uh, that does that mean I'm an old trans person now? Like, I'm only 30. I, are we still the same generation? Oh, God. Oh, God, I'm old now. So that's why people recently got upset when they discovered that she liked and then also left an ambiguous but seemingly positive comment on a post on Instagram that espoused trans medicalist views, leading many to assume, very understandably so, that the post aligned with Schaefer's own views. To get to that, let's read the post. And again, to be clear, these aren't Hunter Schaefer's own words, just ones that she seems to have endorsed. I help all of the people, NBs, who fought to have trans identities no longer considered a medical condition that requires dysphoria are happy because you've won. The red states are beginning to agree with you. HRT and gender affirming surgeries are no longer deemed medically necessary for adults in Florida, and it's not going to stop there. That means more trans people will have to pay for their transitions out of pocket, forcing more of us into sex work. Y'all just couldn't stand to let binary trans people be the voice of this community. You had to dismantle all the guidelines around being trans to fit your narrative so you could feel valid. And then you demonized trans people who challenged your ideals and called them true scum slash trans medicalists. What you don't understand is that binary trans women and men don't have the luxury of playing around with what it means to be trans the same way you do. You challenge gender ideologies from the safety of a cis body that requires no medical treatment. We have to play the game and live by the guidelines that cis people have created for us because that is how we survived. You're not helping, you're not dismantling the gender binary, you're not expanding the minds of cis people, you are making them hate us. For the last time, I am begging non-binary people to take a seat and let binary trans people and more specifically black trans women be the voices of this community because they are the ones at risk. Okay, so lots of breakdown with this post, though I think uh, I should note up front that the post does seem to have a lot of anger and vitriol within its words, 
especially towards non-binary people. And I'll get to later on where I think that anger and emotion is coming from. And also just on the surface, there's a lot of problems with the offensive way that this post has described people. Like for example, saying that non-binary people are living in the safety of a cis body, which isn't the case because they're non-binary people. So their body inherently isn't cisgender, regardless of whether it's conforming to certain aspects of how we view gender and gender alignment, their body is inherently not cis because they're not cis. So already right off the top, we see that this post is being invalidating of people's identities and bodies and trying to define someone's bodies for them. But that's just the beginning of issues with this post. But we'll sort of save it because I want to start more just sort of on the surface with the logical arguments of what this post is arguing. Basically, this post has a transmedicalist point of view. The word transmedicalist, like the term turf, is just a word that denotes this viewpoint and I'm going to use it because it's the word that best explains what the viewpoint is. Though as the post exemplifies, people who hold this view often push back against this word's use because it's a way to break down a viewpoint that is, as we'll talk about at its core, exclusionary and harmful. So how so? How is it exclusionary and harmful? Well, I've done longer videos breaking down transmedicalism, which I'll link up there. And I'll also direct you to uh, Cops Hate Moe's great video breaking down transmedicalism specifically, and I'll link that in the description. But to oversimplify, transmedicalism is a belief that some form of physical and medical transition is required to be truly transgender. Transmedicalists believe that things like hormone replacement therapy or gender affirming surgeries like vaginoplasty or breast augmentation for trans women or breast removal and phallioplasty for trans men and more beyond that are necessary. Now there are gradations of transmedicalism. Some transmedicalists believe that you need to go through all of these procedures to be fully trans. Some say that you need just a few of them and some focus solely on just the genitalia surgeries as required to be fully trans. And so there's a lot of different variations of the viewpoint. But core to pretty much all of these beliefs is the belief that gender dysphoria is necessary and the cause of being transgender. Specifically, gender dysphoria relating to your body. Gender dysphoria itself is a sense of distress, anxiety, or depression caused by a mismatch of your gender identity, basically how you view your gender internally, versus either biological traits of your body and or how you're treated by people and society around you. Now, transmedicalists would argue that the treated by people and society part of that definition is actually not part of dysphoria but only specifically in how dysphoria relates to the body. Basically, they believe that dysphoria is only about your biological traits in your body and how those are at odds with how you sort of wish your body to be. And the only way to treat those things are through medical intervention. Basically, to put simply, trans medicalists believe in the pathologization of transgender existence. That to be transgender inherently is a medical and specifically a mental health problem. It's all essentialized in bodily distress. So. Why is this viewpoint an issue and making people upset that Hunter Schaefer specifically might be espousing it? Well, before I break that down, let me start off by saying I myself am a trans person who had gender dysphoria, specifically around my body, and I've actually sought medical intervention to alleviate it. I've personally been on hormones for close to a decade at this point, again, getting old, and I've had three gender affirming surgeries, including one that I've had literally less than three months ago and that I'm still healing from. Uh, you can even still see kind of the gnarly scar on my forehead here. I don't know if it's on camera, but it's like right there. And I actually did a uh, whole personal video on that surgery. If you're curious about it, it's actually a video I'm very, very proud of. But I say all of that to point out that if anyone was to be a trans medicalist, it would be me. That being said though, I am not because it is important to note that it is not necessary to have gender body dysphoria or any form of dysphoria to be transgender. What being transgender is, again, oversimplifying here, is not identifying with your gender identity assigned at birth. Within the United States, where I'm from and other similar Western cultures, we're all told at birth, based on if you were born with a penis or vagina, that we're either a boy or a girl. If you have a penis, you're told that you're a boy, and if you have a vagina, you're told that you're a girl. When you're told that you're a boy, there are certain social expectations placed upon you, either being emotionally stoic as a boy, you must wear boys clothes, etc. Uh, girls are told to be more emotional, but they can wear dresses and have makeup and, and all that sort of stuff. But also on top of that, all of us do have certain biological traits that we're born with. 
whether it be having breasts or a vagina or a penis or, you know, a flat chest or deeper voices, Adam's apples, those sort of things. And then there are things beyond that that are just completely beyond biological factors, like uh, like wearing dresses, for example. Like, there's no biology there. The girls aren't inherently, like, just born with dresses. And we can see that very clearly within other cultures, for example, where we see boys being considered manly if they did wear dresses or skirts, like if Scottish people wearing kilts, for example. And so it's important to note, as I'll talk about more in a second, that being transgender as a result of this does change from cultural context. But the important thing to note is, is that we're all sort of told within our worldview today that a lot of these social expectations are natural extensions of these biological factors, that girls are naturally more emotional. But that's not inherently the case. Girls can be less emotional, boys can be more emotional. And yes, some of those things can be influenced by biological factors like hormone levels and things like that. But there's no one right specific way that a girl or a boy has to be. But anyways, we're all told that we're supposed to fit into these categories from birth. But in reality, though, none of these things have to be aligned. So being transgender, therefore, is just saying that you don't fit into those alignments that you're told to have. And this can be done in a bunch of different ways. Certainly, transness can come from dysphoria, from feeling your body doesn't match, as it did for me. And that's not an ignorance of biology, by the way, but an understanding of our biology that we have from birth. It's actually a deep understanding of our own bodies and our relationship to it. And it's also realizing that we do have many medical technologies today that can help make our lives happier and healthier by using it to help change or manipulate our biological factors and features. And again, that's what happened to me. I chose hormones and a lot of different surgeries. But again, some trans people want just hormones and no other surgeries. Some people just want surgeries and no hormones. Again, it mixes matches and is different for every single person and what makes a single person happy and healthy. But being trans can also not require any medical intervention at all, but just wanting to appear or be treated a different way. It may just be wanting to wear makeup or wear dresses and even still be seen or called a boy. Or you can ask to be referred to by different pronouns or have a more feminine appearance um, or ask people to like just refer to you as a girl. It's all sort of different aspects of these things that we can all sort of present to make ourselves as individuals happy. And we all have the right to say about our bodies and how we're treated and being respected by other people. If you wouldn't disrespect someone's name, for example, by calling them a different name, like Bob, if they hate the word Bob and their name is Robert, then you shouldn't do the same for someone's pronouns because pronouns are just as culturally made up and assigned to people as names are. And all of this can be done to alleviate gender dysphoria without requiring any medical treatments at all. And it should be noted that these people can still be binary in their presentations, aligned fully with being seen as a girl if they are told they are a boy at birth and vice versa, but not wishing to seek any changes to their biology or medical aspects at all. Or they can also be seen as non-binary, seeking to present somewhere between masculine and femininity or not on that spectrum at all, and just doing their own cool non-binary thing. But also, on top of all of that, dysphoria may not be required at all. Some people can have euphoria and feel really happy at just having their gender affirmed in different ways, whether through medical stuff or cultural stuff or social stuff. Or it can just be a general indifference, being like, yeah, eh, why are you just as cool? That's totally fine. And it's also important to note that you can do this within your own gender identity or without it. There are some people who are assigned female at birth, for example, who will want to present more masculinely and be considered a butch woman, but still wish to be seen as a woman, while someone may present exactly the same way, but say that they identify with being a boy. It's all, again, it's all individual and, and is specific to an individual person. So while we do have some sort of base definition of being trans, also being considered trans within your own personal experience is also a choice on how you perceive yourself. And on top of that, all of this can come coupled together with people seeking to transition socially and medically and picking and choosing which aspects of that that they wish to do. I myself kind of fit in the middle of all of that, for example, because while I am a trans woman and I did seek to medically transition my body to present my body in ways that our culture understands as stereotypically more feminine or like female aligned, I actually present socially in a slightly less non-binary way. More feminine than most people, but not fully like over the top feminine, as you can kind of see my very presentation right now. Not to say that cisgender women can't present this way, but again, I sort of like uh, kind of play in the middle of sort of feminine and masculinity, leaning a little bit more towards feminine. But the important thing overall, just for everyone to note here, is that being trans is just saying, hey, I don't fit into these gender boxes that I'm told to fit into from birth. 
I may fit into some of them or I may fit into none of them, but just the act of not fitting into some of them and then sort of wishing to transition away from that or seeing yourself in a different gender identity from that as a result is being transgender. Which then brings us back to transmedicalism because the issue with transmedicalism is that it views anyone who doesn't fit into a binary transgender experience and importantly, those who don't seek to change their biological features to align with their gender identity as valid. Not only that, many trans medicalists will say that not only are these experiences not valid, that they are just a fad, a recent social trend that like the kids are getting in on. But with the definition of transgender being ever expanding and the rise of what we call trans trenders, right? People who appropriate being trans for attention. Um, you can act like they don't exist. They do. They're obviously not as common as actual trans people, but they definitely exist. And, and well, certainly I'm sure there are kids that out there that experiment with considering themselves transgender at a young age. As kids, we're always exploring our identity and we'll put on different hats to see if they fit, whether it be trans or whether it be a goth or whether it be like a, you know, any sort of different identity. We we're all sort of doing that as kids trying to figure out ourselves. This is actually false overall because while trans people who have felt body dysphoria have always existed, trans people who have just wished to transition socially have also always existed. In fact, one could argue that since our current medical treatments for dysphoria are a more recent development in sort of the history of humanity, there's more evidence for those who socially transitioned only throughout history. Not to say that people who did experience body dysphoria didn't exist throughout history, just that honestly there's probably more evidence of people who just socially transitioned, such as indigenous two-spirit folks or India's Haraja. Or we could even point to the fact that social understandings of what makes a man and a woman who have changed from culture to culture throughout time, with men even in Europe seen as manly for wearing makeup and wigs, for example, as evidence of the fact that like social factors around gender have actually been more fluid than necessarily biological ones throughout history. At least our access to change those things have been more fluid throughout history. On top of this, there's actually been recent studies that have shown that few transgender children change their minds after five years after coming out as transgender. So this idea that trans people are coming out as trans as just a fad and then will change their mind later on is less the case than people would think. But that actually even goes against my own personal experience because my own sister actually came out as trans while she was still in high school and actually decided later on that she actually wasn't trans. And I think that that's perfectly okay. She didn't go on hormones, she didn't go on puberty blockers or anything like that, though she and my parents did at the time discuss possibly going on puberty blockers, which would have been perfectly fine according to our doctor and she probably would have been okay and gone off them and been perfectly fine when she decided that she wasn't trans. But she did play with her identity. She did play with her pronouns and ultimately liked the elements of self-discovery that she was able to uncover during that journey and it also allowed her to know for certain that she actually wasn't trans. And it showcases how being able to play with one's identity in childhood is actually an important part of being able to figure out who you are actually. It's often when you don't allow kids any sort of experimentation or ability to figure out who they are at all that these sort of feelings get repressed and ultimately become a larger problem later in life. As transgender activist and writer Eli Ehrlich wrote, some cisgender people cling to the notion that they can change their children's identity, just wanting the best life for them. However, this typically causes intense trauma, distress that only started to get noticed from mainstream media with the death of Leela Elkhorn in 2014. Leela Elkhorn, for those of you who don't know, was a transgender girl who died by suicide because she was traumatized in this way. Now, this view that trans medicalists have that only people who are bodily dysphoric are actually trans comes from the fact that until very recently, transness in our own culture today in the United States was only really understood through medicalization. A lot of our understanding surrounding trans people today comes from medical research from folks like Ray Blanchard, who is his own problematic figure within the trans community, and I've done a video on him, for example, who argued that transness required medical treatments in order to be considered trans. And a lot of that too also comes out of the fact that there was this sort of stigmatization of being trans, that it was seen as a mental illness and therefore requiring medicalization. A similar thing happened with being homosexual throughout history as well, that homosexuality was also considered a mental illness and therefore like was seen as sort of a medical problem rather than just a thing that someone could be. But because of that, our society up until recently mainly only understood transness solely through medicalization. It's only started to become more mainstream and commonly understood that transness does not require medicalization. Some who wish to vilify this sort of understanding of what it means to be trans will sometimes point to researchers like John Money, who again is a very problematic figure within the transgender community and even outside of it for 
numerous horrible reasons, let's just be honest there. But the fact that John Money was absolutely terrible does not negate the fact that he is one of numerous researchers and scholars and doctors and therapists who have explored and come to this understanding of what it means to be trans and how to best help transgender people. Though, if you're curious about my thoughts on John Money, don't worry, I'll be talking about it in a future video that I'm doing on Matt Walsh. Many trans people up until now were only told to see their transness through that medicalized lens, and many still to this day only see it that way. Even further, as I myself have discussed in videos about my own surgeries, even for those of us who do seek medical treatments or surgeries as part of our trans experience, our being trans isn't cured or fixed or done away with by these interventions. Instead, they are ways to help us along with our transitions in order to make us happier and live healthier lives. They are not the end unto themselves. As Eli Ehrlich, who also had gender-affirming surgeries, said in her own writing, It was not until after I had surgery and my doctor told me that my entire body looked better that I realized how this medicine can be exploitative of transgender people. I did not feel more whole or complete. Surgery did not have the power to confirm my gender. Medical professionals insinuated that my desirability and existence would not be validated until I fully transitioned. According to them, I would no longer feel trapped in the wrong body, which I never did feel in the first place. Instead, I simply felt satisfied that I was finally finished with such a large part of my own transition. This feeling that Eli Articulate speaks to, for those in the trans community like myself who do seek surgeries, sometimes feel that there is this sense and pressure from even trans healthcare providers that validation of our identity is only found through bodily changes or pathologization of our experience, instead of realizing that these medical aspects and things that we can use are merely tools that can be provided along a trans person's journey to help us live happier, healthier lives by being able to choose how we control and dictate our bodies. And this is why many trans medicalists will see trans people who only wish to transition socially in some way or non-binary people as a recent fad. They've always existed, but weren't understood, focused on, or acknowledged at all, and therefore seen as not actually existing because they weren't seen. They were made invisible. Buck Angel, for example, is a prominent trans man from an older generation than myself who argues that way and is a very terribly problematic figure that, again, I spoke about in that video I linked to before. So we can already see why there's a divide on where trans medicalists sit when it comes to understanding larger cultural contexts of being transgender versus non-binary people and other members of the trans community who are accepting of non-binary people and those who wish to not medically transition. But the reason that these views are a problem doesn't just come down to the fact that we're ideologically different, that it's just a difference of opinion, but the fact that these views can actually be used for harmful ends. And this person's post that Hunter Schaefer liked illuminates why. There has been a large push recently by many right-wing and conservative groups to attack transgender rights around the United States. There's been, for example, attack on trans women's rights to be in sports or all trans people's ability to enter the bathrooms that align with our gender identity, etc. But the biggest push recently has been to attack trans-affirming healthcare, especially for transgender youth under 18. Several states, especially right-leaning states like Florida, Texas, and Mississippi, have all passed or attempted to pass bills outlawing trans-affirming health care for youth and labeling it in some cases as child abuse. Beyond that, Congresswoman Christian Nationalist and all-around kind of horrible person Marjorie Taylor Greene has recently drafted a bill that would do the same nationwide. I'm one of the Americans that are sick and tired of our government allowing the abuse of the American people. But when it comes to gender-affirming care, which is really child abuse, this is actually an assault and it's child abuse. So a lot of trans medical care rights are currently under attack and it's absolutely horrific. To know that care that could help so many trans youth is not only being denied them, but being actively vilified to the point where trans kids' parents are being criminally charged, investigated, or vilified for trying to take care of their kid and help them live their best life is undeniably awful, cruel, and disgusting. However, trans medicalists like the one that this post exemplifies argue that the reason that this attack on trans-affirming health care is happening is that right-wing folks who are pushing these bills are doing so because they believe that transness doesn't require medicalization. Trans medicalists believe and are arguing that it's non-binary and binary trans people who don't seek medicalization, arguing that you don't need medical intervention to be trans, that these lawmakers are listening to and ultimately then saying, oh, well, if, you know, medicalization isn't needed to be trans, then we'll just vilify all transgender medical care. 
And as a result, these transmedicalists are attacking and angry at binary and non-binary, non-medical seeking trans people as the problem. Yet this belief fundamentally misunderstands where these attacks on trans rights are coming from. Right-wing politicians and pundits are not attacking trans healthcare because they are fighting for non-binary trans people or believe that transness doesn't require medicalization. Far from it. If you actually listen to the rhetoric that they're using, it's not just anti-medical treatment for trans people that they're arguing, but it's stemming from a vilification of all trans people overall. But even so, American Academy of Pediatrics, that was their book promoting puberty blockers, chemical castration, sterilization for kids. Okay? And that's his, in, in terms of the, the medical community, that's as mainstream as you can possibly get. And so when Rachel Levine claims, when he says that there's no argument to that, you know, within, within the medical community, it is, a, it is a shame and an outrage that that is almost, almost true. There are exceptions, but they are few and far between which does not at all, even a little bit, serve to legitimize this kind of butchery that's done to children and the drugging of children. It doesn't serve to legitimize it. What it does, unfortunately, is serve to further delegitimize the medical industry. It's not that they're listening to non-binary trans people, but the fact that they're saying that non-binary trans people and trans people in general are a social contagion causing children to seek medical interventions before they're ready or can consent to such things. That apparently we're handing out hormones like candy to kids who ultimately won't wish to transition, forcing them to have irreversible surgeries that they'll later regret. But then the other thing that is scary about social media is um, the is conta social contagion of mental disorders. So we know that we're aware now that certain proportion of young girls who are identifying as gender dysphoric. On the surface level, this argumentation does brush up against the argument that I was alluding to earlier, that there is this pressure by some people to only see trans people who seek medical transitions as valid, and thereby there is this seeming pressure to get medical interventions in order to validate one's trans identity, a pressure which shouldn't exist. And if this was the argument that these right-wing folks were using, to a degree, I would actually agree with them. The argument is less to say that medical interventions are required to validate trans identities, as trans medicalists would argue, but instead to allow medical interventions like hormones, surgeries, and more to be seen as simply tools one can use as part of a trans person's experience, to be used or not used at one's discretion, and with time to consider them and their effects on you, both long-term and short-term. However, while surface-level right-wing arguments may seem to touch upon this, that's not actually the argument that they're making. But it's actually just dehumanizing trans people if you listen to the exact way they discuss these things. Describe the fact that someone who was once a woman, and really still is, had her breasts cut off. Do you know who I don't understand at all? The transgender ones. Because if you undergo a sex change operation, you are basically committing a crime of self-harm. Every surgery is a risk. And these transgender people, to me, are disgusting. But you'll also hear them just generally call all trans people gross and disgusting. It all goes back to this sort of right-wing idea that there is a natural way for a man and woman to be. That it's either God-given or like biological traits that are innate in us that mean a man is this way and a woman is this way. It all comes from this argumentation, not that like medicalization isn't necessary to be trans, but that the whole aspect of being trans is itself a non-starter. That, I mean, those are Christian values, but they're also, that's, that's also just reality. It's, it's biblical values, male and female, he created him. But that's also science and reality. All these things work together, as they so often do. It all goes to conservative ideologies focus on tradition and what feels right. And as a result, to them, to break out of these gendered roles that we are assigned at birth feels, quote-unquote, wrong based on how these gendered roles have been made pervasive and thus seemingly normal in our society, and they consider it ridiculous to question them on their face. What has existed for a long time must be inherently correct, at least as conservative thinking as a philosophical ideology goes. That trans people are medically ill for even thinking in the first place that, like, we can have access to medical technology that exists. 
like right now, they'll say things like, oh, you think having a breast makes you a woman? And the answer is no, we don't think that having breasts makes me a woman. I just think that having breasts make me personally happier, which is why I sought the medical interventions that we have to get them and that thereby makes me happier, and also in a larger cultural context that might make me be more treated as a woman, which also aligns with how I like to be seen and treated and makes me happier as well, because we just like to be treated a certain way. On top of all of this, a lot of these right-wing arguments also ignore a lot of things about transgender healthcare in general, just completely misunderstanding what transgender healthcare is. I mean, first off, it also ignores that trans healthcare has been heavily gatekept throughout history, either financially with a lot of trans healthcare being expensive or not covered by insurances, or through endless bureaucratic barriers. And again, these barriers don't exist because people believe that, oh, being transgender doesn't require medicalization, but just the fact that they think being trans, period, is itself a ridiculous notion, and therefore not even needing to be understood or medically treated beyond simply saying like, oh, that person's mentally ill or crazy. On top of this too, this has also ignored how medicalizing and gatekeeping transgender healthcare overall has always disproportionately affected trans people from more marginalized communities or identities who already statistically face larger barriers to accessing any healthcare, regardless of if it's trans affirming or not. Again, as Eli Ehrlich states, the medicalization of transness that created these conceptualizations will never represent the community as a whole. There is no universal trans experience or biological mechanism that causes transness. Medicalization will always disadvantage those experiencing intersecting oppressions, denying access to trans people of color, queer trans people, and trans people with mental illness. In terms of vilifying trans healthcare for trans youth specifically too, it even ignores that even if one can get past those barriers, that in most cases trans people who do get irreversible surgeries are typically 18 and older or have had a long history of medical care and discussion from therapists, doctors, and affirming parents who make sure that when they choose to get these irreversible surgeries that it's the right choice for them. It also ignores that most under 18 year olds getting trans affirming care are typically only being given puberty blockers if that at all, which are generally safe drugs taken with a doctor's supervision that are reversible once someone is taken off of them. And my friend Mia Mulder did a great video breaking down the science of puberty blocking drugs and why they're safe that I've linked below. Now, are they 100% perfectly safe? No, but no drug is. Like literally watch any drug commercial and they will have a list of potential side effects, which often will sometimes include like death, for example. And that's why when you take puberty blockers, it's done with a doctor and after a doctor says that it's okay for you to have them. And so it misses all of that. But that's just taking those arguments at good faith. If we just take those things at faith value, it's just completely misunderstanding what it means to be trans and just shows a general disgust and misunderstanding of what it means to be trans in the first place. But really, we all know that that's not really what the argument is going on here. If we're being truly honest, these lawmakers and pundits are attacking trans healthcare because they're using trans people as a scapegoat to galvanize their voters or viewers with culture war bullshit to gain attention, throwing trans people under the bus in doing so. It's an incredibly cynical attention and power grab saying like, oh, think of the children's sensationalization using trans people as the villain in order to gain attention and votes. And they do this by intentionally misinforming their audiences about trans healthcare and what it means to be trans. For example, just a singular one, they'll often conflate hormones, which do cause irreversible changes, especially in trans women who become sterile as a result of taking hormones after a few months, with things like puberty blockers, which are generally completely safe and reversible. These lawmakers and pundits will argue that hormones are being given to little children like 12 year olds right when they ask for them with no other doctors gatekeeping them at all, which isn't the case. It takes a lot of work to even get believed to be able to get hormones and hormones aren't typically given until someone is 18 or at least has a therapist who says they can have it at around maybe 16 at best. Are there times where people have been given the wrong drugs early or given a surgery early or things when they weren't ready for it in which to detransition or to cause mental health problems? 100%, I am not denying that that hasn't happened. It definitely has. But statistically, those are outlier cases, and the argument for that is not to say that we shouldn't have any trans-affirming healthcare at all, but to make sure that we do trans-affirming healthcare better and have better sort of ways of understanding what to do for trans healthcare for individual people. But not only that, these lawmakers also ignore the fact that puberty blockers are given to non-trans children for things like hormone imbalances. So these lawmakers will lie about the dangers of puberty blockers and argue that trans kids shouldn't have them, but ignore that other kids take them safely which just directly shows how these rhetorics are just being used to discriminate against trans people. Another example could be a new fake viral news story pushed by conservative news organization The Daily Wire recently showed information that the puberty blocking drug Lupron was linked to thousands of deaths. 
6,370 to be precise. However, the drug is used not only for puberty blocking, but also prostate cancer. And those 6,000 deaths were of cancer patients. Information that the Daily Wire intentionally left out, making it seem like it was trans kids being killed by the drug, further vilifying trans care. And that's just one example. These pundits and lawmakers will lie about trans people all the time, saying things like we don't understand biology, when we actually understand biology probably better than most people, especially when it relates to our own self. It's not like we're ignoring what our biology is or that we're saying that, you know, certain aspects of a person make them inherently a woman or a man. We're actually saying completely the opposite. They'll also generate the stigma that we're all mentally ill, a stigma that trans medicalists help incidentally bolstering by saying that transness only stems from dysphoria, by the way. Or these lawmakers and pundits will argue that we're sexualizing and harming children in order to vilify and dehumanize trans people to their base, then causing their audience to go and attack us, and then incidentally vote for them and watch their shows. All this should be keyed in by the fact that they use terms like social contagion. That should show you the dehumanizing aspects of all of this. Those sort of phrases are often used to dehumanize people. They are trying to argue that trans people are inherently less than. It's not that these people are for affirming all trans people no matter what because, oh, we want to be uh, especially helpful to the non-binary trans people and, oh, uh, trans medicalization is awful because uh, you don't need medicalization to be trans. It's literally just, ew, trans people are icky and disgusting, gross, and also evil, so let's deny them all that we can. Even further, we can see how many trans medicalist groups, such as SEGM, often run by cisgender men who led research in the pathologization of transgender people, such as Ray Blanchard, are often the ones who bolster this idea of transness being a social contagion, and argue for the elimination of transgender people. That's not just hyperbole, as we can see in this SEGM interview that argued for the elimination of transgender health care for trans youth and trans youth care in general. Not to mention that they helped create these laws that the person posting at the beginning of this video was upset about, with SEGM even helping draft the Florida anti-transgender health care law. So literally, trans medicalists are the ones furthering the elimination of healthcare rights for trans youth, not non-binary trans people as the earlier angry post claimed. Even further, trans medicalists like Ray Blanchard have appeared on numerous right-wing podcasts and platforms. Trans medicalists, along with right-wing conservatives, are the ones arguing for the elimination of transgender people in general, not non-binary people. Like, being honest with you, I really don't understand how people don't see that if something like all trans-affirming healthcare were somehow instantly outlawed tomorrow, these attacks wouldn't stop there. Not only would they try to outlaw all trans healthcare, not just for youth, but then they would continue on from that to attack us with bathroom laws in order to try to push any trans people, non-binary, binary, medicalist or not, out of public view. To say that it's not okay to be trans at all, it's all about putting people back in our boxes to not allow us to be out and be safe as ourselves. It's trying to force us to be a certain way. And the reason for this vilification beyond just trying to galvanize people is that transness, both as a concept and us as people that exist, inherently pushed at the barriers and hierarchical structures that our society is set up with. Like, for example, there is one aspect of the trans medicalist post that I do agree with. We should be listening to transgender people of color, both binary and non-binary. Because, as writer Maria Lagunes discusses, and the wonderful YouTube creator Lily Alexander explored in her own video, our very ideas of womanhood and gender norms in today's Western culture stem from colonialization's attempts to downplay black folks, and specifically black women's humanity, compared to the fragile, passive white woman. Black women weren't seen as women, and not even as human. Gender is a construct created not only to reinforce a binary of man above woman, but also as white people above black people. So it's important to point out that while white trans folks, like myself, do face discrimination both as women and as trans people, and we shouldn't ignore that, we are also not the primary targets of transphobia. Black trans women and non-binary folks are. But trans medicalists don't see this at all because they've centralized their experience of transness as the only valid one of it. And while some may be willing to acknowledge the discrimination faced by black folks, as this post exemplifies, they will create a barrier within their own community and gatekeep who is seen as trans or not. The truth is, we're all discriminated against, and we're all allies in this fight, and quite often non-binary people are the ones even more vilified, because we're not even seen as willing to exist, whereas some trans medicalist people will be sort of limitedly accepted by right-wing groups because they are pushing against non-binary people and aligning again with this idea that there is a right way for a woman to be. However, many times these trans medicalist folks will push further misinformation about trans people. Like, for example, 
Trans man Scott Nugent recently appeared in Matt Walsh's What is a Woman documentary and spread a lot of misinformation and outright false facts about transgender surgeries and aspects of the medical community around it. Now, I know I'm making a big claim there, and I'm not going to really explore that further in this video, but I will be talking about it and getting more into the specifics of that claim in further videos. But if you want a video right now talking about a trans medicalist trans person who has spread misinformation deliberately about the trans community, I've also talked about Buck Angel doing the same in a video that I discussed earlier about him. Which brings me to my last point, because speaking of which, I do realize my own privilege within all of this. I'm a trans person who does come from a decently middle-class background who lives in a trans-affirming area with insurance that covers most of my surgeries, and I was also able to get and afford all of them. So I do have a very deep sympathy for the anger and emotion that those who have been denied access to the care that helped save my life. It honestly pisses me off that anyone would be denied the care that literally just made me who I am and allowed me to continue living today. And it's that same anger that trans medicalists do feel. Trans medicalists, like other trans people, are being gatekept from their own affirming care that could help change and save their lives. But because they have been so gatekept and misunderstand a trans experience, they take their anger out not at those vilifying and attacking trans rights, but those who they don't want to understand, non-binary and non-medically transitioning trans people, because they're the ones that are closest to them and they can lash out against. It's similar to what TERFs have done being cisgender women who have sublimated their trauma and pain at living in a patriarchal society that does attack and dehumanize all women, but then place that blame on trans people. But ultimately, like how TERFs are stoking a fighting of women fighting women, just cisgender women versus trans women in this case, so too are trans medicalists just trans people fighting other trans people. It's marginalized infighting in a community that only serves to benefit those in power already. The only people that benefit from trans medicalist views that set binary and non-binary trans people against each other are those stoking those angers and resentments in the first place, the lawmakers and pundits attacking trans rights. Trans medicalists must be pushed back against because of this, and I'm not here to say that they shouldn't be. We should call out horrible people being horrible and not understanding those who are right in close proximity to them willing to educate them. But they are doing so because they themselves are misinformed and understandably angry. They're just angry at the wrong people. And as for Hunter Schaefer, yes, I got back there in the end. My hope is that maybe we're misinterpreting this. Maybe she doesn't actually hold these views or has more at least nuanced thoughts on it than the simple ones that this post was espousing. And if not, I hope she is going to educate herself if she wishes to continue to be a trans leader that fights for everyone within her community. Because ultimately, my hope is that young trans folks like her who do face dysphoria, as she's been open about experiencing, aren't going to reinforce the same divisions that have hounded the trans community for so long. But reach out a hand in understanding that our community is already strong, but is stronger still when we stand together, united against those who are our real enemies. All right, I know that was a very long discussion. I actually did not intend this video to get as long as it did. I literally sat down being like, oh, I'll talk a little bit about Hunter Schaefer, and then the script got uh, super long. So here you're getting an extra video that I did not intend to make on a Tuesday. But that being said, this was a very straightforward video, uh, and I'm doing that because I do actually have a much bigger and longer and much more involved video that is coming very soon, and that is part two of my video about Matt Walsh's What is a Woman? And the reason it's getting so long is that it's actually become something a little bit bigger than just about that film. It's going to focus mostly on that film, but the film provides an inroads, like this video did, to talk about a lot of anti-transgender views. And I'm actually trying to get a lot of work done for it, talking to many experts and other people, in both in the video and outside of it, around a lot of the misinformation around trans communities, especially the ones that Matt Walsh has espoused, both in his show and in the film. And also a little bit of stylistic flair as well. It's not just going to be me sitting talking to, uh, to the camera like I did for this video. So please be patient with that video. And also, uh, don't forget, I also have a video on The Boys coming up very, very soon. A couple other videos here and there that will probably be releasing before the Matt Walsh one. But that is going to be my next big video that I'm going to be doing on this channel. And it should be coming around m early to middle of September. So be on the lookout for that. Um, but yeah, I am, I'm excited is the wrong word considering the topic, but I'm, I'm hoping that'll be a video that'll be very, very helpful. So if you wish to support me doing videos like that, I'm only able to do that because of folks on Patreon. Patreon helps pay my bills. So if you want to support me there, you get new and videos and you again, help me supporting me doing what I do here as well as other perks as well, like being able to have like Skype calls and stuff with me. Skype. 
Discord. I don't know why I said Skype. I, that was a weird... I haven't used Skype in, like, years. Anyways, um, beyond that, I'm also on Nebula. I also have a podcast about Babylon 5 that you can find below. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to this channel for all of that stuff. But beyond all of that, thank you so much for being here, my friends. I hope that you're all taking care of yourself, and I hope that you, as always, live long and prosper. Hello there, patrons. Thank you all so much for supporting me. I could not do this. I could not pay my bills. I could not live. I could not be a weird, nerdy dork for you on camera without all of your support. So, mwah. Thank you to all of you. I appreciate all of you. And with that said, an extra special thank you to Catherine and Beth, Carrie Elrin Frost, Joe Herman Holt, Elysia Ty Tivy, Miranda Janelle, Lily Gray, Ashley Allen Bo, Kiki Yo, Stephen Kleinard, Jem Shin, Ish the Mad, Mary the Mellow, Randy Thompson, Allie Gobert, Matt Chung, Super Desi, Wellington Marcus, D. Ray, Vincent Ellington, Boyd and Mary Bethel, Sylvester Routop, Barbara Ruski, G Man 42, Joseph Dewey, Felicia Toast, Chloe Dollar, Alex Miller, James Krivda, Elizabeth Christensen, Dominic Noble, Jennifer Fuss, Zone One Librarian, Andy with an I, Jessica Wright, Sean McKenzie, Sonia Nero Perdo. Lily's Hazel Eyes, Nathaniel Froughton, Alicia Stice, Mag Mag, Ferenga Toe, Transit Toronto, Shield Maiden 4444, Wendell Zabizzle, Sasha M, Spencer Brownlee, Tangy Wilson, W Randy E D, Steven Richardson, Spooky Heather Sylvia, Drew Bach, Ulysses the Pagan, Carrie the Neuro Turtle, Pissed and Twisted Garage, Huh, Zoe Kerr, Melinda Walters, Fox E, Kevin Freitag, Willow B, Beatrix Purvis, Cyber Quaker, Casual Observer, Sean Piper, Martin J. Lower. Flynn, Lysa, Gretchen, Badger, Meta, Whisper, Jedi, Indiana Jones. Absalon is greater than Silly Christy, Odd, Just Odd. Sarah Bystem, Sarah Leslie Hutchkins, Kayliss, William Stewart, Sky Skinner, Patricia Cromptick, Becky Sparks, Blueberry Hill, Laura Demero, Sarah Lemero, Hia Rhesus, Nathan Steele, Blue, Troy Stahl, Justine, Melody Ann, Winter's Good, Verdix Kai, Leo the Boyd, Geek Filter, The Tipsy Changeling, Maeve, Zim Lua Kincaid, Tony the DC Nerd, Jason Knott, Luna T, Strawberry Pup Tart, Holly Walters, Nikki Gordon, Bloomfield, Celestial Dawn, Angie Pugh, Michael Goaty, Abigail Marie, Kelly Davis, Bella Lagusi, James Hodge, Vale and Corey, Honkin' In. Mwah to all of you. I adore you all. And again, thank you all for your support.